happy to be here. Fantastic. Well, I've got the book here for the YouTube channel. Okay. So where should we start? We normally start with what's keeping you up at night. Well, uh, I'm very concerned about the state of the global economy. Um, I'm worried that what is currently often being described as a recession, a couple of bad years, is not a recession. It is a big structural worsening problem. Global rather than UK? 100%. It might be particularly bad here in some ways, but definitely global. And what's the structural problem? Growing wealth inequality, rapidly growing wealth inequality, a transfer of wealth over time away from the middle classes and governments towards the very rich. What do you, you know, it's, it, what do you think in capitalism needs to be fixed then? What, what is, are there, are there any quick wins? Are there any sort of obvious, obvious so, problems? I mean, we've all played Monopoly and seen what happens. You know, once you start getting money, it, yeah. it gives you a lot of power. Yeah, I mean, I am not an anti-capitalist, but there is an obvious structural force in capitalism, which is people who have a lot of wealth can accumulate wealth very quickly. And in a growing economy, that might not be so problematic. But when the economy is not growing, what you get is what we have had the last 25 years, which is the rich eating the middle class and eating the government. You need and to get wealth flowing in both directions. And when you say the wealth growing very quick, I mean, once you're talking, maybe, maybe we categorize a bit. Once you've accumulated uh, 10 million quid, you will accumulate wealth in a sort of 5% a year or whatever. Yeah, so if you've got 10 million quid, that's, you know, you get half a million pound a year. That's yeah. Passive income, passive income. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you had half a million pound passive income, I don't know, Andy, maybe you do. Um, how much would you spend? Uh, passive income, so savings yeah, so on income. on top of on top of the millions you make from this podcast, I, I know, I know, I know, I know from clients, I know from clients and experience, people hate spending capital. Mm -hmm. People hate it. They and, don't even and, spend most of the capital. And income. actually, fascinatingly, if you have someone who's worth a hundred million, you know, they they struggle with spending the money, their capital, rather than their income. So you know, just as much as someone who's got a grand. You know, I don't have half a million pound passive income. I probably make hundred grand a year passive income, um, and I spend 30, 40 grand and I accumulate the rest. And, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of people who are much richer than me, have much higher passive income than me. You know, Rishi Sunak is both worth 700 million. So we're talking about, you know, 30 million passive income. I just imagine bars full of money. What, really what they do is they, you know, they give it to financial advisors and what they call family offices. And these guys just invest. Yeah. But, but what, that, what we're seeing, you know, we have this idea of investment, but if you look at actually the different groups in society, what you see, especially in the last sort of five, 10 years, is massive, massive decrease in wealth of government. Government wealth is collapsing. Middle class wealth is shrinking. And the main way we see that is decreased ownership of property for young people and much higher levels of debt, mortgage debt. So middle class wealth is decreasing. Why, is, why did it ever grow? I mean, why did the middle class wealth grow and why is it now collapsing? Well, if uh, it's, never, it's always it's yeah. been that way for a long time. Money no, makes money. No, but the boomers could buy houses. Uh, that sounds very derogatory. But the boomers could buy houses but really cheap. You know, I was what? on the way here. I was listening to Revolver by the Beatles. First song. Classic. Tax Man. Mm. It's one for you, 19 for me. The Beatles paid 95% income tax. And listen, I don't campaign for high rates of income tax, but at the same time, we had 90% inheritance tax. Listen, if, if you tax very wealthy people very high amounts, it becomes very difficult for them to accumulate wealth. Do you think that's going to do it? Because taxes from the Second World War up yeah. until Thatcher, yeah. taxes were like... 80 to 90 to 102 yeah, percent at their worst and i'm not a massive campaigner for super high income taxes mm. but i think what we have now is kind of the worst of both worlds which is somebody like myself and you know i worked in the city i was a banker and you know love us or loathe us the truth is i came from a very poor background and i made a lot of money people like me pay you know i was paying it was 50 percent top rate of income tax plus your 10 percent national insurance so i was paying 60 percent tax um at the same time duke of westminster inherited 10 billion pounds and paid nothing and it starts to look very much like a class-based mm -hmm. tax system. Yeah. Why do I pay on 2 million, 60%, because I come from Ilford and I talk like this? No, it's not because you come from Ilford and talk yeah. like this, because that would, that would misrepresent it wrong. If you yeah. earn a lot of income and you live in this country, you're taxed mm. very heavily. And I mean, it's, yeah, got, yeah. it's gone Com down a little bit. It was 55% it was probably yeah. in your time. It's yeah. probably 50% now. But where now. do you acquire those assets from? A lot of people Wait, wait, no, don't switch to assets. Yeah. You have to break this conversation down because yeah. it's a really, I'm with you, yeah? But yeah. I think it's a really interesting point, you know? That, and look, my grandfather started this business and he didn't build it because back then taxes yeah. were 90 odd percent. Yeah. And it was about 200 grand in morning money. So yeah. my, I thought he, thought he was a lazy bastard. I only found out the other day from my dad, no, back in that generation, no one bothered. 
Yeah. So there's definitely a problem if the taxes get too high, you stifle it, in, it because you think, well, why am I going to get out of bed for five, ten percent? Yeah, yeah. Can't be asked. But that's that's income, and I think I don't think it's anything to do with where you come from. The fact that if you earn a lot of income and you live in this country, to be very clear, you will pay. 50% tax was about the seventh highest taxpayers in the world. We're very good, but, but assets but different. People's got around that. Just, I mean, this was the bit in the book that really yeah. got me it was yeah. really near the end. The bit where you talk about the guys that you grew up with yeah. and the fact that, cause you probably don't know cause you haven't read the book. Gary was expelled at 15, 15, uh, 16, just 16, 16. just before GCSEs. Mm. God, that's weird. Um, for carrying weed. Selling three pounds oh, worth I did, of cannabis. I did read that. I did get yeah. that for, yeah. That's um, at the beginning. But the, the point in the book is, had the, you know, had his school called the police instead of just expelling you, you know, you would be one of the people, one of the guys you grew up with potentially selling drugs, making a lot of money selling drugs. But how are we getting there though? This is like a left turn like, of the traffic on the, lights. On, so if I, I didn't get a criminal record because my school didn't call the police. Right. But had they called the police, I would have got a criminal record and then I would never have got this job basically. Okay. You know, but at LSE and in trading, he's surrounded by most, you know, you are a rarity, right? Most of the people that you're trading with do not have accents like yours. Yeah. Despite the fact that Canary Wharf is quite conspicuously in East London. I found London, that bit interesting. That again is at the start because my understanding was the, the traders, the brokers were generally people, the, the posh boys have the money and then the traders with the brokers generally came from, you know, Essex, state school, salt of the world. So, do you know. want me to break that down for you? Yeah. So there's a big distinction between traders and brokers. Okay. So traders are the guys that make the bets. Um, and of course there is this kind of, uh, there's this myth of the sort of Cockney wide boy trader, which I, I kind of fulfilled that stereotype, you know, Cockney geezer, artful dodger type. Nowadays, that was probably true 30 years ago. Once we get into the late 90s, early 2000s, suddenly you kind of, you get the global elite sending their kids into trading, going to LSE, London School of Economics, going into trading. And then the trading floor changes massively. And now if you go onto the trading floor, you will hear very few Cockney Essex accents on the trading floor. Interesting. But broking, which is a separate industry, which doesn't, they don't do the deals themselves. They match people together. Broking remained definitely. So I was trading in the late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, broking remained very Essex. Uh, and you, you could get, it was very much, you got him because of who you knew. So there's a character in the book, Harry Sambi, yeah. who got him because he was my mate, basically. Um, and that remained very Essex. And this, this is kind of really. Brokers get you things or get you information. Exactly. There's this class dynamic where the traders who make the deals are increasingly posh boys. And the brokers, you sort of have to kick around and get things done. To be honest, when I was there, they were their job was mainly basically party planning for these traders, getting yeah, them drugs, yeah, 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 yeah. getting them into yeah, getting leader, you, stuff, you know, right, getting yeah. you, you know. And information too, the, the, the old school apparently was, you know, the posh boys with the money would be like, shall I invest in this company? And then they'd ring up X who'd be like, well, let me ring my mate on the floor and find out what's really going on, you know. And, and, and I meant on the floor of the factory, you know. like. But the point I make, it has still hadn't really got to my point, which great. was... Um, if you're trying to make a lot of income, if you happen to be born, you know, with fairly wealthy parents who can send you to a good school, who have contacts in the city, you're going to end up making that income in the city. If you happen to be born to parents that have no contacts, that don't have any money, that, you know, are in Ilford or wherever, you're going to, you can still make a lot of income, but you're probably going to make it. Selling drugs. But there's another strata of people. There's not which... middle class, technically. The middle class can become accountants or solicitors yeah. or doctors or work in the city. You need intelligence. You need hard work. All these things. You know, the city is one of the few places you can go. And yeah, it's a lottery whether you get in, but if you're bright enough and go for it hard enough, you can go on a lot of money, you know, and it's a corruption. Mm -hmm. But I think you're making a deeper point, which is much more interesting about assets. Yeah, exactly. And that assets mm -hmm. accumulate money. And I agree. Like, I have a basic theory of like... You know, the problem is the billionaires don't pay tax because they don't live here. They live in all sorts of places and the tax system kind of yeah. breaks down. Then everyone's angry at the people in this country earning millions who are actually paying a lot of tax, yeah. putting a lot into the system and they're not the problem and they're probably privately educating the kids and private healthcare. But, but yeah. the accumulation of wealth is a problem also because if you take it a step further, let's say you go, okay, I'm going to build a family dynasty and I'm going to, I've saved 50 million quid and I've got yeah. eight children. Yeah. yeah. Is it going to bring these kids happiness? Is it going to probably well, not? This is a big Most part of the, the story of the book, Andy. This is okay. a big part of the story. So, okay, we're not, I'm not to, the guys I'm working with, they're not this sort of generational wealth. In most cases, there's a couple of guys, Spengler probably is from sort yeah. of low-key generational wealth. Um, 
But these are guys who are making this sort of one million, two million pounds a year. And they they have very sort of luxurious lives. There's one guy, Chuck, who's my, my boss. And when he becomes my boss, he's probably already nearly 50. And he's probably worth 10 million quid. And he comes into work every day. And he works 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. He does it for his family. He never sees his family. You know, why, why, why are you working 12-hour days? No, I, I love Chuck. I, don't, I wouldn't say a bad word about him. But, you know, what, I think there's a lot of media about trading floors, mm-hmm. Wolf of Wall Street, that, that portrays them as kind of decadent and corrupt and throwing midgets at dartboards and sleeping with hookers and snorting cocaine, this kind of stuff. I, got very, I get very frustrated about that because that is not what I see. Mm. The trading floor. Did you ever watch Industry, this program, Matt? It was this uh, HBO series about trading floor. I watched the first two, si- two episodes. So much sex. I was a trader for seven years. I never once worked with a woman. Yeah. It's, these yeah. are like the yeah. least sexy places. Like, yeah, but bands. people would have been very bored by that particular show. You know, you've got to have Without the sex, a little bit mainly, of titillation yeah. in there. But what I wanted to, I want to get under the skin of these guys and mm. ask the real question, which was sort of bothering me, which is why are these multimillionaires so unhappy why are they so unhappy mm. why are they so crazy some of the guys i worked with are absolutely insane the stories well, you, you were see immensely the book. unhappy well, yeah exactly yeah i mean that's a big part mm. of the book as well like you know and i, I really didn't want to when i wrote the book i didn't want to be like look at all these terrible guys but i'm all right you know i, I was a part of that mm. you know i went into that job for a reason same re- same way everybody else did and it made me unhappy same way everybody same way it did everybody else you know and it's but there's this great irony that and I totally agree with what you say. I don't like the way that we in society point out the bankers. Say the bankers are the bad guys, the bankers are evil. And these guys or are anyone making, earning money. Yeah, yeah, these guys are making one million, two million pounds a year. You know, there's guys out there worth hundreds of millions, billions, don't even work. You know what I mean? And the bankers mm. take this sort of, they take all the flack. And listen, you read the book, you'll, you'll know there's some bankers I'm not keen on. But some of my, I work with some amazing people, some amazing, intelligent people who worked hard. And, and I totally accept, and I talk about this a lot in the book, I don't think it's right that we live in a world where a kid like me can make a million pound a year playing a computer game. Whereas people like my dad, you know, work hard for yeah. 20 grand and struggle. And it's not just my dad, it's everybody's dad. Um, but I, I wanted to show you what it really, I wanted to show you what it really was. I, yeah. I wanted to show those. And I, we've, we've created this society, which I don't actually think it really works for anyone because the really rich people I know, you know, after the people who can't, who are struggling to feed their kids. And there's a lot of them. The second most unhappy group of people I know financially are the really rich people. Because they're, t- they're terrified of losing it all the time. They're totally separated from humanity. And what I worry about, and the, the reason I do what I do on the YouTube and I wrote this book is, I worry that we are moving as a society towards what we see in other very unequal parts of the world, like Johannesburg, like Mumbai, like Sao Paulo, where the rich live in palaces behind barbed wire walls. Yeah. And, and that puts somebody like me in a situation where I have to choose, you know, what side of those barbed wire walls do I want my kids to be on? And I don't want my kids to be on either side of that, terrified of the people outside or struggling to feed their kids. You know, I think that's where we could look. look at what's happened to poverty in this country in the last five years. It's, I find it such an interesting conversation. We, we had a great fortune of interviewing Martin Wolf, and he talked about how Britain's always been ma- had massively disparate finances. Yeah. And, the, and the southeast of England has been the richest part of Europe for a long time, mm-hmm. and the rest of the country has been really poor, some of the poorest parts of Europe still to the day. Mm-hmm. And even in London, there's huge disparity, and yeah. you go back to whether it be the docks or whatever. Always the, 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 the aim has been to sort of build up the middle class. Actually, when you talk about middle class, it's actually, in a way, you, it's losing it. But America was where I remember being young and going and my dad saying, look how wealthy everyone is because everyone had a dishwasher and everyone had a washing machine and they're really nice big houses. And it was the middle class yeah. in America and it yeah. was a very rich mm-hmm. society. What I'm really interested in is, you know, if it was better here, if you, you know, and it has, COVID's made it worse, things are getting, it's getting worse and worse and it's a huge structural problem in this country. But he didn't have any answers, Martin. He's like, I don't... Pff- I don't know how, what I can suggest. It's always been this way, but why was it better before? What made, it was it the seems, tax? I don't know. I can't answer the why it was better, but I just, you know, I look at, like, look at me, for example, I'm not married. I've never been married. It took me till about 40 something mm-hmm. to have enough money to buy a house yeah. because I was having to buy it on my income alone. You know, I used to think to myself, you know, at the time I was an equity partner in a law firm, and I'm mm-hmm. thinking, I'm an equity partner and I'm struggling to buy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it was a one bed, it's a one bed flat. Yeah. And yes, it was in the centre of London, so it was expensive, but it was just as expensive as a kind of three bedroom house 
yeah. you know, somewhere out of London. Yeah. And I was thinking, how on earth do other people do it? Because I'm actually earning a lot more yeah. than most people. And, you know, now my mortgage is about to go up a grand. I'm thinking, how am I going to cover that? And if yeah. I'm struggling and yeah. I earn way more than most people, how, yeah, yeah. Do, how do the people on like, you know, your average salary, which is what is 20 something grand. Depends where you're in the country, it? but yeah. In London, it, it, it's just over 30. Yeah. Like, how, like, how do people do it? They struggle, mate. Yeah. They struggle. They skip me. Listen, I grew up like that. They skip meals, you know, yeah. they crowd into small, overcrowded, sometimes damp housing. You, you said that you think the rich are scared of losing it. I mean, I, I, I find this, this some very interesting things. Like as someone who went to boarding school and had an awful time, but you know, there's a weird link actually. It's a psychological thing. It's called survival mentality that people who went to boarding school but it, uh, have the same mental um, framework basically as people who've been in care or been in prison. So there's this weird yeah. connection. And you may have noticed this if you came from, you know, a difficult um, upbringing that you often connect with people from boarding school. So actually, they're the, often the people with the most money and the people with the least money. Yeah. There's this weird but, connect. Yeah, it's funny actually, you say that because we've got a boarding school character in the book and. Um, he loves me. He, he like, like latches onto me. Do you a, like him? Well, this is a question. Uh, well, you've read the whole book. I, I think that... I don't think you were really negative about anybody but one He is in some ways quite... A, he does some pretty ridiculous things and some quite mm. nasty things. But he also does some really kind things, weirdly. Like, there, there's, you know, there's a really sad story where one of my friend's parents passes away and he sort of needs help. And this guy comes in and is really, really affectionate to him. And at my lowest moment, so, because this guy is kind of one of the villains of the book, but at my lowest really moment, really this guy swoops in and saves me. And there's this kind of question about why? Why did he mm. choose to do it? But he's, um, but I think it's as you say, and I think it's really, really weird what we do in boarding schools, which is we send our the richest kids in the country there, and we give them this kind of artificially hostile environment. We create this artificially cruel and hostile environment to to make them hard. And he wanted to make me hard. And to I, make I them rule the empire. Disassociate basically. them from their families. So yeah, like, but know. it's, yeah, and it's, it's, I think you, you kind of, you breed a cruelty into these people. Mm. And I actually, there's this one conversation I had with this guy, which I, is one of my favourite scenes in the book, which is he's just absolutely screwed over one of the traders who I quite like, just like destroyed his career. And he takes me for a walk. And I think he's going to explain to him what he did. But instead he just says to me, Gary, I've got a problem. And I'm just thinking, what's he going to say? And he says, as soon as I meet someone, I have to know whether I'm better than them or whether I'm worse than them. Wow. And I'm, I'm just waiting. Like, and I'm, I That's must be 20, 22. And then I'm just waiting for to hear what he says. And he says, and if they're better than me, I hate them. I hate them because they're better than me. But if they're worse than me, I despise them. And it's even worse I, because I despise I fucking him. Hate wow, everybody he, in the world. He sounds yeah, quite complex, is, but, but for, for but, me, but it's is, a competitive. It is a yeah, competitive but, culture. But do you think you know? Let's just try and break this down. So there's something. There's obviously multiple structural things that cause capitalism not to be perfect, and some mm -hmm. of them we've come up with fixes for. You know, we could say health, you know free healthcare might be a fix to capitalism because it doesn't you know yeah. seem to care about that. Maybe we should work on. But there's an interesting thing about like. What is, you know, I, I, I like the idea, though, of a wealth tax to some extent. So do you, I, yeah. You've just got to design it really fucking well. 100%. And, and I do agree, as, as, as my father's tried to build, he's a really amazing guy. He's built this business. You know, I didn't see him much, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we work in this family business that was my granddad's. But he's, he's built up some money. And the money he's built up for us, the only thing it's for is health and education. So mm -hmm. it, it's just like, and it's not a lot of money. It's like way less than a million quid, but like two of us have a trust that's for three, oh, there's four of us, but two, one of us just died. But um, the siblings, we, three of us have a trust that is for the fourth person in a circle. So all mm -hmm. of us basically have, it's like 300 grand each. And it's the, it's the base, um, it's the base on our house yeah. and we lend it to the other one. So basically okay. if they get into trouble and get a divorce, you can withdraw the loan. Okay. And it's also there, you know, if you want to help the person, you know, uh, I mean, the money's in the house, but effectively it provides some sort of cushion for health and education. Yeah. I think you can expand that. I think maybe, you know, maybe you had a lot of kids, maybe there's 5 million quid or 10 million quid you, you could yeah. put into health and education. What about old age? Yeah, and I yeah. think those things are nice to pass down in a family. Don't you, you're not going to have any money unless you work. 
yeah. but it will educate you as best it can. And it will, if you've got serious health problems, it can pay the money to fly you to America or whatever yeah. the fuck. But outside of that money is just so corrupting, you know? And, yeah. and, and I do agree. There's this such a problem that they just sit it in financial funds. It just grows. It's a sort of, you know, it gives them, I don't know. What, what meaning does it pay the world? None. It's that you know? sort of structural problem. I think this is in the book. I can't remember, but yeah. it's that structural problem of like, there is an element of everybody wants their own family to be all right. Yeah. 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 You know, so you kind of, you buy into the system enough to ensure that, you know, you're all right and your immediate family. Yeah. And your descendants okay. is the yeah. complicated. Well, how far do you go with yeah. that? I mean, yeah. I'm very much, I just want me and my immediate family to be okay. Right. But then you've, got to at some point think about the bigger society around that the fundamental problem with capitalism and i'm not anti-capitalist okay you need to address the dynamics of power which is once you allow a certain group of people to become extremely powerful then they can use that power to dispossess weaker groups and that is what we are seeing now we are seeing mm. a massive flow of wealth from the government which is a weakened group from the middle class which is a competitively weakened group to the very rich. Why, 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 the, why is the government getting weaker with money? Because they're borrowing more money because the country's poor. But I think the, the most classic thing, the best example to see why the government is weakened is COVID. You look at COVID, all right? Okay. Let's start on the assumption you have to do a lockdown, okay? I'm not going to get started with that argument, okay? Let's start, you have to do a lockdown. That, make that assumption. Straight away, basically, economically, what a lockdown is, is the banning of the spending of rich people. Because if you're poor, your expenditure is rent, food, mortgage bills, that's still, all still happening. But if you're rich, you, ha you have a lot of luxury expenditure. That's all illegal now. So you ban the spending of rich people. Well, straight away, like 30% of poor people lose their jobs because they're working in the luxury sector. Government's got to replace it. So government comes in, prints the money, gives it to the poor people. Poor people pay their mortgage, their bills, goes to the rich people, can't spend it. So the, what you have here... Because their mortgage is, you know, their landowner. Yeah, what you have yeah. is a fundamental impact. The, the problem you have, and you ha the problem is power. The, the thing is, the rich people own everything. And when the rich people own everything, it becomes, what, it becomes very difficult for the poor people to bargain. Because there's, what you have is a tiny group of people who own everything. You have 90% of people who need to work for this tiny group of people who own everything, including really high-tech machines, which means they don't need workers. The power imbalance is massively there. And then suddenly, the wage level collapses. And then the government has a responsibility to prevent poverty. But then the, the government can't tax the rich because the prime minister's bargain is the richest man in the world. So then the government just prints the money, gives it to the poor. It goes through. Its problem is fundamentally balance of power. I, li I like the circle, but I have to take it, you know, they, they, they do, there is a lot of tax in this country. It's very heavy tax. No, I mean, you, on, on me and you, yes. But on the super rich, no. Well, you have to, we have, I think what the second thing I was going to say, defining it into the rich and the poor is, 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 is a much more nuanced groups of people here. So, you know, but, you might be saying the foreigners. So if you live here, you're going to pay a lot of tax and inherit. We have inheritance tax. It could be higher maybe, but it's 40%. But it's totally avoided by the very rich. No, the, no. It's by the, by the very rich. If they don't live here, you've got to be foreign because you need to do things like excluded property. If you live in this country, you cannot avoid inheritance tax. You have to live in this country less than 90 days a year, probably 180. So you're sometimes. telling me when Rishi Sunak dies, or he's going to pay his wife's foreigner. The only things you can do, and I'll tell you what you can do. You can put it into a pension, but only up to a limit before it's taxed, which is about a million quid. Every seven years, you can put 325,000 pounds into trust for your children. Yeah. And you'll get a million quid if you're married and you both die and you Same. leave your for kids. And is is but, it farmland uh, exempted and aim shares? If you have a uh, business property relief, and farm, um, agricultural property relief, which is actually harder and harder to claim. But if they are trading businesses, they can be exempt so from what? inheritance tax, but they have to be trading, running businesses yeah. that are passed down to your family. They're not, you know, they're not, they may what? be producing income or something and you get 50, it gets harder. I don't know the answer to this, but what happens if, if I'm super rich, right? Yeah. And I'm living in the UK not all my assets are going to be in the UK, right? It doesn't matter if you live so here. So if I put if my assets in... You can't in, do it. Not if you're British. If I own a load of buildings in it New doesn't York, matter. I've still got to pay inheritance 100%, tax on them. 100%. Okay. As a British person, if you live here, the laws are extremely tough. There is no you, movement of assets abroad is illegal. There are possibilities if you did something in the past, you know, maybe in the 70s, 80s, if you've got a grandmother overseas who's rich and could set something up for you that maybe then you put your shares into from a company here. I mean, there's 
argument, but honestly, it's so hard to do. If you are British and you live here, you are paying 40% tax above that. You make a good point yeah. about trading uh, businesses, yeah. but any wealth and shit that is getting well, hit. I would like to see one single if example you're a foreigner, of a billionaire, different. a British billionaire who has died and lost 40% of their wealth. I yeah, but because I haven't seen I, an example I, yet. No, no, there will be, and I'll correct it. Yeah. It's they're not British anymore. Okay. Because it's about domicile inheritance tax. And domicile yeah. is the country that basically you're born in or you go to. And what happens, yeah. people move their domicile. They move to Monaco, most of them. <laughs> you're super rich. They, they, you know, they get out of it because they don't, frankly, it ain't that great a country. If I said to you, listen, Gary, you can save a hundred million pounds a year and live in these two beautiful, much warmer places for, because you need three places. So you're not, so you can do like, the interval's right. And some countries have loads of tax reliefs. Like Italy will only tax you 10% for your first million and then that's it. So, you know, lots of people live there. So, you know, but you've got, you've got, you've got to go. My question, Andy, why do we allow it? Why do, why we, do allow we allow it? what? Why do we allow these guys who own billions of pounds of British assets to not pay tax because they claim they live in the Seychelles? No, no, because it's not a British problem. It's an international tax problem. Yeah. And it's not so something China we can solve. So does China allow it? Well, every country has its own tax rules and ways they get their claws into you yeah. based on whether you live there. America, if you've got a passport, fuck you, we're taxing you. Yeah. So all American citizens globally, but they're America, yeah? They've got Le Vegas and fucking California. We're yeah. Britain. So the rule they just yeah. abolished, remittance, the rule yeah. they abolished is a law that goes back to Napoleon. After Napoleon, we said, fucking hell, no one's coming here for the weather of the food. So I'll tell you what, we'll have this rule where you can come here and we won't tax you on your foreign stuff. That's yeah. just how we've developed our but tax code, but it's the yeah. same globally. Basically, if you live somewhere all year, every year, that country, if it has inheritance yeah. tax, by the way, most countries don't have inheritance yeah. tax. We do, so and quite a high one. Are you saying that it is beyond the power of the British government to tax billionaires? Yeah, I am. Let me ask you one question. What if, happened if, to if, Roman Abramovich? If he doesn't, he lives here in like three, uh, how does he live here? If he lives here, he will be taxed here. He, wait, 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 wait. He's, he's Russian, right? Yes, when yes, the government well. decided it wanted to tax that specific billionaire, suddenly they turned out Roman Abramovich can't put Chelsea Football Club in a bag. Listen, these guys, they own British assets. M yes. The cash flows come yes, from Britain. Yes, and British assets. And when, always when the government wanted to tax Abramovich. Wait, wait, you have to slow you. down. When British assets are here, they're always taxable here. Assets yeah. and income. If you perform work here or you own assets here, it's taxable here. Yeah. So you cannot be taxed as a billionaire because if before you enter the UK, you set up what's called an excluded property trust in an offshore country. So you set up this thing and you put all of your foreign stuff in it because mm -hmm. a trust is not yours. The best way to understand a trust is like throwing a ball. You know, you, you aim it, you throw it and it's left your hand. It's not yours, but you put it in this trust and then you enter the UK and then you could live here but all the, the time. the comes back. You can't spend the money here. You can't bring the money in. We'll tax it. No, it's really important because the super rich don't pay tax because they don't fucking live here. They, and a lot of them are foreigners to start with. Yeah. And, and it means someone else is taxing them. You've got to understand that too. A lot of the anger sometimes like, you know, Richie Sunak's wife, she pays fucking tax elsewhere. We're, she's a oh, foreigner. What percentage do you think she pays? I don't know. It's not our business because she's a foreigner. Our claws, trust me, the British tax system is an aggressive tax system with long claws, but you kick in now within four years. It was seven years before, but up until that, it was just a setup. So they, people come here and spend and live their money and relax. There was a great line by Bill Gates talking about this, about the, un, about taxing billionaires. And he was like, I've paid whatever 20, you know, I've paid 20 billion, Low tax 20, America, 20 billion dollars tax, $30 billion of tax. And I think that's fair. You know, you want me to pay a hundred billion. I don't think that's fair. And you can go and look at the number that he's claimed and you can go and look at his net worth and you can say, okay, he's basically admitted that his tax he's paid on his lifetime income is 2%. And of course it's a big number because the guy's phenomenally rich. You know, if, if, if you allow this group over there, there's a group here, they're becoming really aggressively powerful. They're going to overpower you, your country, your government. And they're going to take I'm, all of the Gary, wealth from everyone. I am hundred percent with you. We have a yeah. serious problem with the billionaires yeah. because it is it? that is the bit I agree that the yeah. money goes up there and it's not getting taxed at yeah. all. Yeah. Because, well, but the, what they do the, with the only money they way make. you can solve it, and Gary, yeah. you have got a grace voice out there. Yeah. So if you can fucking get this message, it's an international <laughs> yeah. tax problem. Hundred percent. You've yeah, got I to get. That. So I have. Okay, here's a way you could solve it. Yeah. You could not allow these people to enter your country at all unless yeah. they had some. This is my simple suggestion: a simple certificate in their pocket. 
passport or something that basically, I don't care where the fuck you live. You can go live in the Caribbean or wherever you want yeah. and you can have 50 million a year tax. Yeah. Ta- I won't tax it. I don't yeah. know. Pick a number, uh-huh. 20 million and the more money you can find. Let's say you've got 10 kids, 50 million, have a fucking time of your life. After that, 50% World Health Organization or whatever. Yeah. You know, just say it's a 50% blanket tax on everything above that. But you have got to get, you know, everyone to the table. So the only other way of getting everyone to the table is start shutting countries. If America said, right, you can't come to America unless you do it. Yeah. And if I think everyone's that's a pretty good idea. It would be you, great. You because you'd, it. you'd say Europe, the one thing Europe has is everybody wants to come to Europe. Yeah. I mean, people know, I, I love Asia. Don't get me wrong. I'm offending yeah. every other country. But you ask anyone, Europe, Europe is just fucking mind blowing. I mean, in beauty yeah. and whatever. So you shut Europe unless you prove to us that you're, and to be honest, yeah. Europe are probably being one of the best at trying to get there. And Biden tries to do yeah. it with companies. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I'm passionate about what you're passionate about. So it's really yeah. interesting yeah. to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. You know? I think there's other things you can do as well. You can, you can stop these companies from being able to sell to Europe. Yes. Or companies yeah. which are owned yeah, by yeah, you foreign can close billionaires it. who pay very low rates of tax. But you know, you're a smart trader. You yeah. know, this kind of thing often doesn't, you don't get what you want. You know, any kind of restrictions in trade and shit always fuck up. Free trade. The big problem you have is, I always remember when um, early 2010s, uh, when they brought in the tax on second home buyers, extra stamp duty for second home buyers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I looked into the details and there was an exemption for people who buy more than seven at once. No and, and Jeremy Hunt went and bought seven flats. And I think the, the big problem you have is that oh, I say I go out there, say, but say I go out there and I, I, I succeed in my aim of building a big public demand, popular demand for cut our taxes, tax the rich, super rich. And, and I go into the to parliament and I storm down the doors and we say, you have to do this. My concern is that you have politicians who are very rich and are funded by the very rich. And they put in a tax, which on the, Face of it looks like what I asked for, but it's riddled with these loopholes, which have been lobbied yeah. for behind closed doors by their father-in-law or by their, their rich billionaires. So um, it's exactly what you say. Um, it's not it, the design. Basically, of the it is British crucial. government couldn't do much, but they could do some things, and I think it would be interesting. Like, say, a guy you know uh, is is from family wealth, which is very rare. But I used to sit a little bit at school. There were a lord or something. They would have these. They would have no income. Mm-hmm. Brokers fucking houses, but they they'd have this house worth twenty million. I think some of those are estates that we'll want to preserve. So you got to like, I think you just got to do it much slower. Again, it's always short politics, isn't it? You got to come in yeah. and say, look, internationally, if we do this too hard, all the lots of the talent leaves because at yeah. the end of the day, but that's ta- I'm not talking about taxing income. It's wealth. It's well, wealth, 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 wealth. I'm listen. I'm all for low tax on income. Attract the talent here. Make the business yeah, yeah, happen here. Yeah. But it's the hoarding of wealth that is the yeah. problem. The hoarding of wealth that and the, because because then these this group becomes so powerful. They are able to buy everything. And yeah. then if, if they're buying everything, then what I think is we, I think we often fail to connect the growing wealth of the super rich and the shrinking wealth of ordinary people and the growing oh, consumption of the super rich. Yeah. yeah. Right. You need to connect these two things. Like how do you expect if, if the wealth, the wealthiest wealth is growing really, really, really quickly and they're buying all the assets, they've got massive passive income. So they never sell any assets. If we give all the assets to a group of people who never ever sells any assets and never has to sell any assets. Of course your kids will never get a house. Of course your kids will never. If, you, if you're walking into a market and one guy owns everything, you're coming in with nothing. You're not going to get anything. And this guy's going to increase. It's, it's about no, dynamics of power. And, and it, it's difficult, but we have something. Listen, stopping terrorism is difficult. You don't say, oh, it's hard. So, you know, we, there's nothing we can do. No, no, we, but we have yeah. to, to. My problem is, is we've got to stop shouting at the government. Start, it's an international thing. Yeah, you know? I agree. And, and, and and like, I we, can, we can turn our taps up here and it will just fuck our country. So we have to get everyone yeah. to I the table. I also think it's a psychological thing as well, though. I think psychologically, a lot of people just equate wealth with like being better. Yeah, you know, like if you've got a lot of money, you must be. My dad thinks like that. If you've got a lot of money, you must just be a better, more intelligent, more capable, more whatever human being. Almost a religion. Do you know you don't feel like that sometimes? It's the other way around. I I mean, I feel terribly not better and shameful for being coming from privilege, and I feel shit about it. Part of the problem is that that a lot of a lot of ultra wealthy people kind of get more because everybody kind of. Like it's almost like everybody gives them stuff because it's biased. It's definitely they bias. just think they're better. Well, I had a mate who studied fashion at Central Minds, really, and then he had some this some random billionaire, just like 
founded a fashion company and hired this guy. And the thing is, that this guy probably has a passive income, 20 million quid a year, right? His dad's a billionaire. And um, the reality of the situation is he gets 20 million quid a year for having the right dad. And there are some people in the world that, that do that. But he doesn't want when people say, what's your job? To be like, well, I get 20 million quid a year for having the right dad. So what he does is he, he, he starts a fashion company. Fashion company never made any money. But then he says, well, I own a fashion company. And how much money does he make every year? 20 million quid. And this guy probably believes he's making that money because he's think, a really good businessman. Did you man. not think he probably just feels ashamed and he tried to do something because he felt like he wasn't doing anything with his life? I mean, flip yeah. it around. Who wants 20 million passive income? That'll destroy anyone. Because you, you reminded me when I briefly worked in a hedge fund in my first job and you reminded me, why are these rich people unhappy? And I never forget being in the office. It was at 2000 when there were big bonuses about... And this guy came in the office and my boss, David Jarrett, and then um, he was saying he was depressed. He'd got a three million quid bonus and he didn't know what to do with his life. And I'm sitting there as a 20 year old kid and you're just like, how is this sentence making sense? You know, and that's the weird thing in life. It's the journey, isn't it? You but that's know? exactly what you talk about in the book. You living on a mattress in a, in a flat with no furnishings it's, and making huge amounts of like bonus yeah, every year. There's this thing people always ask me. And there's a couple of things in the book, which is when I made my first bonus, the guys at work were like, you have to buy something for your dad. What was it, 13 grand? Or something? 13 yeah. grand. And they were like, you have to buy something for your dad. And I, like, I come from very, I'd never bought anything even for myself. You know, I don't come from that kind of background where you buy, just buy things for people. I didn't know what to get him. And they're like, what does your dad like? He likes football. All right, get him Sky Sports. So I got my dad Sky Sports. And then when I moved out, a couple of years later, I cancelled my dad's Sky Sports. And people always ask me, why did you cancel your dad's Sky Sports? And I th what I think is quite funny about that is, You've read the book, right? I think it's quite clear that my dad's Sky Sports is making me unhappy. And I'll tell you why. Before I started working at Citibank, me and my dad and my mate Harry Sandby, who's also in the book, every Saturday we went and watched Leighton Orient when they were at home, sometimes away as well. Every Saturday we went down there watching them lose 1-0 away to Dagenham and Redbridge. You know? And when I started working at Citibank, I'm working long days, drinking out in the evenings. and the weekends, I'm tired. I don't want to go watch my team lose to Barnet. You know what I mean? And um, I stopped going when I started. And then, then I make this money and then I buy dad's Sky Sports. And I would wake up on Saturday after going out Friday, hungover. I'd go downstairs and I'd see my dad watching Sky Sports. It, it broke my heart. It broke my heart. And it broke my heart. Home, yeah. And then, and I know it's stupid, but I just, what you see and what I saw, because I come from a poor background, you know, my parents are not the happiest people in the world, but. They're good people. They love each other. They work hard and they're, they're happy enough. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. And then you, you, you suddenly have but all this money. But also they're Mormons, so there aren't that many things they're allowed to enjoy. There's the other scene where this kid, Titsy, my junior, tells me I'm mm. too homo homini lupus. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. So I've become like the biggest trader in the whole world in the bank. And I'm just like, I'm basically, I've, I've become a bit of a dick, to be, to be fair. This is the dick, the dick phase, me, Gary being a dick phase of the book, which lasts longer than maybe it should have done. And, um. I, there's a couple of kids sitting behind me and I basically tell them to fuck off. Like, you know, don't, don't watch me trade. And then this kid says to me, you're a good trader, but your problem is you're too homo homini lupus. And I'm like, what the fuck is homo homini lupus? He goes, man is wolf to man. man He's like a little Italian kid. And then I say, to, I stand up and I say, look, look at these guys around. Look at all these dicks around us. Every single one of them has got their hand in my pocket. Everyone's trying to rob me. Everyone wants my money. I'm the man on the trading floor. Don't tell me man is wolf to man because we're surrounded by wolves. For me, the, the deeper story I wanted to tell, if I can be a little bit wanky and mm. philosophical yeah. about the book is what it does to people like me. Money. Just, not just money, but convincing people that their job in life is to make money and to compete with each other. That, that is your fundamental responsibility. It seems responsibility. to me the fundamental thing about the book is you just want to win. Like yeah, it doesn't so matter called what the trading it is you're doing. You, do. I want I mean, you win. just want to win it. Do you consider yourself competitive? Yes. When I was a kid, it was, so, I, you know, I go in on this, I win the job in a card game, first of all. And then I go in on an internship and there's three trading competitions. I win all of them. There's a public speaking competition and I won that. I, I just, I was, it's, you look at it and I was mad. There's this great line by some, some playwright in the 17th century saying, ambition is a great man's madness. And I think we, we laud ambition in our society. I'm not saying ambition is necessarily a bad thing, especially if you come from my, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't ambitious. But I see what it does when you turn people into just animals to win, mm. win. It, I think it's slightly the city. I mean, the city is, is, is a place of money with huge salaries. You're 25 years old. There's nowhere else in the country I can think of yeah. that you can 
it's a system you can go through and if you get in, yeah. you'll earn a, a million quid in your 25. And as my boss, he's, uh, David said at the time, you know, you that makes you think you, you're you better than other yeah. people because you're meeting, why are you earning 20 grand? I'm earning a million. You must be an idiot. Yeah. But you could be a car salesman. You could be a vacuum clear yeah. salesman. You know, It is the city. But what I do now, as you all know, is I've got a YouTube channel where I communicate to ordinary people, say, listen, inequality is getting bigger and bigger. If we don't take action on it, it's going to really affect your kids' lives. Your kids will live in poverty. We need to take action. Wow. The number one question I get by a million miles, can you guess what it is? Uh, how can I make how money? How can I make money? Yeah. And it's not just the city. It's like every fucking law firm in the world, particularly I'm a corporate lawyer, right? Every corporate department is all about how much have you made this year for the firm. And every, every business is about how much have you made for the business. Yeah. You know, it, it's been an experience, I guess, that's been so like changing, but what that, that leads you to try and do something about it. And that now, you know, what, what, what should people be doing about this equality? Forget about making money. What are you hoping people would take action with? So whenever I hear that question, there's basically two things, which is one, like, what is the policy you want? But number two is how do we get that policy? Yeah. Um, so I actually think mm. our only chance, you point out this is an international problem. Okay. There's only really one really good example in, in recent history of a significant decrease in inequality, and it is post-war Europe and just really? pre-war America. Really? Because, yeah, where, yeah, and America particularly. Yeah. And, and so it's this sort of second half of the 20th century. Poor became me reasonably yeah. wealthy. And that is, you know, before, look, most of history is, is big inequality, big poverty for most people. And then you have this period of time after Everybody the Second has World a dishwasher. Everybody yeah, and I think a... what is really important to notice yeah. about that period is it doesn't happen in just one country. Okay, the US is a bit ahead. But you see living standards rise all across Western Europe and, of course, in the USA and other places, Australia, Japan, these kinds of places. And I think that is because the broader argument was one that we need to tax rich people a lot more. And I don't think... That's what you think it was. It wasn't because it's also a time of great technology and peace in a way, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of wars, but... I mean, I was thinking that when you had the Industrial Revolution in Britain, there's probably a, ma a massive increase in middle class. But I yeah. think the tax argument Not is really interesting. Until, does it, you don't really get... At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, actually, living standards collapse, actually. For, for You get like this uh, this growth of this super wealthy At the beginning, class. that's true. And yeah. then, the, then the, it creates then this Then you get sort some of industrial second, disputes in the early 20th century, but it's not really till post-war that you really get broad increases in living standards. Taxes weren't high everywhere around the world, though, after that. They were really high in the US and the UK. They were coming up in Europe. They were a little bit less, actually, in Europe at the time. But they definitely, st I mean, I know from experience in this business, they were stifling people being entrepreneurs. And yeah. people and argue the, that that the balance was too high on income versus wealth, yeah, even right. back then. And there, there were reasons why it became unpopular. And I, I don't think that that was the perfect model. But you can't deny... Well, there's just so many, I think it's cause, cause and effect or whatever that thing is. I, I'm not saying it's not part of it, but, you know, I mean, also people started to move around a lot. Yeah. Populations have massively increased. So, you know, there was less, I don't know, housing stock. I mean, you, you, I, I, I think we all boggle. You look at that graph yeah. and you look, all right, so the people, <laughs> the, the, let's say the 1% with the like 80% of the money yeah. and they're paying the 0% tax. Yeah. And if we took, if we just left them all, guys, have 50 million each, have a hundred million each. How yeah, many yeah, kids yeah. you got? You get 10 million a kid. Okay. Yeah. And if it's just you, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. But you know, if you drew a line, took all that money and just started building houses, changing the world. I mean, you run into all sorts of problems that you'd need a government to run that money, but you could yeah, set yeah. up your first international but, government. You, know, you could also use that money to significantly reduce taxes on working people. You know, you don't, I think, I think people like to think, people think I'm arguing for higher taxes and they think, Oh my God, I don't like higher taxes. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm arguing for lower taxes for ordinary working people. Well, I think anyone who's I think tax levels are fine, and if they could be lower, if anything, you, we're, we're, it's it's this huge group of untaxed. I mean, yeah. I, honestly, I'm, if people are paying fifty percent on their income, the wealth is the, the more complicated problem. Yeah. But I mean, and and that's the problem yeah, with wealth. I think that's what you're saying is reduce income taxes. Yeah. I think in a sense increase. we're saying the same thing. We are, and we're completely we're agreeing. Thing, it's yeah. more like how do we get there? But I, I talk, this, you know, different people have different opinions on this. I personally think the best way that we get this, in my opinion, is to establish a broad understanding amongst ordinary people, working class people, middle class people who are increasingly struggling. Your life will continue to get worse in a material sense, your kids and your grandkids, unless we deal with this growing problem of inequality. And I believe that 100% to be true. And I think if people understood that, they would demand change on that. And I, I don't think, listen, there's a lot of very wealthy people out there that don't want this to happen. I don't think people like 
myself have a chance of achieving this until we have broad popular support for it. And I think the reason we don't have broad popular support for it is because people don't realise where this is going. People are, increasingly, I think people are conning on. And that's why you see people are sort of going crazy and going these internet conspiracy theories, which are often like really damaging because people are, be, keep, people keep being told this is, an, this is a recession that will get better in two years. And people can increasingly We've see it's getting worse. Corner. It can't, it can't it. make any this sense. This is why it can't make people any keep sense. voting in increasingly crazy governments because more and more average people in the street are realising the ship is sinking. And it's the job of, I see it as a job of people like myself, people like yourselves, to sell an alternative that, that will work. And my big fear is, I'll tell you my big fear, Labour win the next election. We all know that that's mm. very, very likely. They'll come in. They are not serious about reducing wealth inequality because they don't understand, like I said, that that's yeah, the core of the problem. Well, they won't reduce wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is rising very quickly now, so that will go up. Living standards will continue to fall. Because, well, you're trying to put it on the agenda. Fucking great, man, because I agree, people have got the wrong agenda. But people will lose faith in the centre-left. People have already lost faith in the centre-right. Centre-right has to move further right. They'll get in on a more anti-immigration rhetoric. That won't work either. They'll move further right. And listen, it brings me no pleasure to say this, but it is difficult for me to look at the situation now and not be reminded of the early 20th century. Because if living standards keep falling, look at all of the centre parties have collapsed in Europe. The, the faith has been lost in the centre. Unless we, able, we are able, people demand an alternative. What is the loudest alternative in the room right now? It's obviously anti-immigration. And if that doesn't work, what comes next after that? But it's because, you know, to a, an extent, globalisation has fucked people outside of, yeah, like, yeah. London. Uh, we, ha we have to we acknowledge that immigration doesn't play. affect everybody in the same way. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a city worker yeah. who is employer in you know, builders, you're, you're not affected the same way of a big yeah. immigration of builders as if you are a builder, you know, obviously. And yeah. I think, I think I, I was quite, you know, I was quite upset about Brexit. You know, my, my dad and my brother voted in opposite directions yeah. on and I saw the split in my family. I saw the sort of venom they come in and, and I love my dad. I love my brother. I don't think either of them are bad people. And I think they both had, there was logic behind what they were saying and there was emotion right. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what upset me was, you know, okay, I come from poor background. I come from London. I went to LSE, I went to Oxford and I live in, you know, the people I work with nowadays are mostly well-educated. And um, people were saying, we shouldn't give non-educated people vo a vote. And stuff like that made me, and I, I think that the big risk you have, I, I think what's going to happen next is inflation will fall over the next six months significantly. That's almost Good, because I need to redo my mortgage yeah. and rates, I'm fucked. Rates will come down. That will take, you know, by the end of the year, they'll probably be down to four and a half, maybe lower. Um, and you're already seeing this, I've been saying, once those rates start to come down, asset prices, including housing, will go through the roof. And the big problem you have there is this country is split almost 50-50 on whether your family owns property or not. I think we have to accept there is increasingly a large section of this country which is destitute poor. That's like 50% now. And there's another sort of 40% above them, the bottom sort of half of which is, is, is starting to worry. And if, if we, what I can see is a big divide growing, and I think the political right will intentionally stoke this, between the very poor and the slightly richer homeowners. And there's, there's, a, there's a racial element to that, which could become very problematic. You know, and there's a regional element to that. And I think that I, I really worry about, I worry about the future of this country. And it's why I do what I do. And I think we need to find ways to unite those groups. Well, you raise a reason because summary, I mean, you know, again, Martin Wolf put it slightly different about Labour is the, this become this party of the university educated and, you know, because services become this party of yeah, very sort of right wing and poor and just this this group that you wouldn't even associate it. And, you know, how can you ever get a liberal in? And he was like, well, you'd have to, he was sort of guessing, well, if you had a terrible government and a Jeremy Corbyn and then you had a super right blue, then you might finally, because that's what you're saying might happen. Or or, or you're saying actually the, 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 they're in the centre right, not knowing what the fuck to do. And people start voting for crazy shit again. Maybe this, but you need this sort of pulling apart. So there was this space in the middle to say, finally, everyone say, well, right, come on. It's sad we don't vote them. It happened once before. Yeah, I mean, listen, I am trying as best I can to create a non-political movement for a fairer tax system where we tax wealth more, where we tax work less, where we make. And to be honest, I think the, what I campaign for, I'm a part of this group, Patriot Millionaires. We campaign for 1% wealth tax above 10 million pounds. We're not going to get that. But I think it's worth considering, if you were to tax wealth above 10 million pounds, 1%, that would not stop wealth inequality from growing. Because these guys make 5%. I'd go much higher too. I'd I think say, you, you, what, 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 and we're not going to get that. So I think this tells you that, I think we need, what I want is for your average man on the street to know, to be convinced, listen, 
I know my life's getting worse. I know my kids' lives will be worse than mine. Unless we take serious action on inequality, that won't stop. But, you know, and again, I've never really worked out why it is the very much turkeys voting for Christmas thing. That you look at these people and you can't, can't work out why, for example, the Conservatives keep getting in for the last few years when everything seemed to be going to hell in a handcart. And then you listen to like a Vox Pop on Radio 4 where they've interviewed people in, you know, Rochdale or whatever. And you get the people saying, well, actually, you know, they've reduced um, my income tax by 1% 1 or whatever it is. So I'm definitely going to vote for them now. You know, it's like... I mean, we we could, okay, this is what we could do. We could do what America does. Say, if you've got a right to live here, a passport, we tax worldwide. That's what America does. And a a fuck ton of people would fuck off. I mean, rich people. Uh, But we could just get on with it and then say, right, now, if you want to live here, we're going to, and you know, but I I don't know. I don't know. I think we need, I think you start with the idea because, you know, I'm trying to build a big YouTube channel and this kind of stuff. Um, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow and then I'm gone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What I want is to leave this idea. And if you don't fix wealth inequality, things will get worse. The power of this idea is it's true. And I said in 2011, things will get worse. They got worse. I said in 2020, at the beginning of COVID, inequality will go up and things will get a lot worse. And they did. The politicians have to say things will get better in two years and they'll be wrong. And this is true. And people will see it get worse. People, see, people will see it get worse. And the, the power it's been getting worse message, for, for, true. For, for a while. I also while. think we rely too much on, oh, we're British. We're not like, you know, Nazi Germany or whatever. We'd never vote yeah. for those kind of people because we're British and we're all yeah. about like the middle ground. And, like, and I, thought, yeah, I think there's I'm also not sure a kind that of... That's true yeah. uh, listen, what I see the future of this country... I, I, you know, have you ever been to, to Mumbai? You've been to Mumbai? Mm, like seen? Mumbai. No. I stayed in a luxury hotel in Mumbai, 2010, my first time in Asia. I don't know. I walked out of the hotel. There was a family lying basically naked on cardboard boxes, dying outside the hotel. This is what it go. And you, you, there's little kids, little girls, five years old, begging. You give one some money, 100 come. And don't think that that can't happen in this country. Because, you know, read Charles Dickens, it happened. It happened. If you don't, go and look at the really unequal countries of the world and, and tell me that's a place you want to live. Mm. You know, this can happen here. This can happen here. You need to manage the distribution of wealth and power. It can happen. Mm. Yeah, it's a powerful point. What, so we've maybe covered this, but I'm just going to say yeah, it again because it. it's a question I like. What's your biggest fuck up, would you say? And, and what did you kind of learn from that? Up. So there's a, there's a, so in 2011, I was Citibank's top trader. Yeah. Most probably changed. that was my big year. And um, Is it like a leaderboard? No. Everybody knows though, right? Within the departments, you can see everybody. So within the Citibank uh, division, I, I can see it. Although to be honest, I wasn't really looking at it. But there's a, there's a great character in the slug called the slug in my book. He's the big boss. He came over and told me who the top trader. And I was sort of got my skin shiver. And um, so I was the big trader in 2011. And then I go home. And... Um, by that time, I was a machine and I go home and I'm in the corner of my front room doing my investments, 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 investments. And then my girlfriend at the time, who is called the wizard in the book, that's actually what I really called her. Um, yeah, we used to work. That's what I called her. And she came around and I see when she come in, she looks at me and she's kind of worried. And immediately I'm a bit pissed off because I'm, th- and then I'm just, and then she comes around and she's like, you know, what's wrong? I'm like, what do you mean what's wrong? You know, I just got paid like, like 2 million quid. Like, what, you know, she's like, well, why, why are you look so stressed out then? And I'm like, well, it's a lot of money. This is a lot. I've got to invest this money you know and then she goes to me if i just made as much money as you'd made the last thing i'd be doing is sitting alone in the corner of my front room stressing the fuck out and uh i I think i put in the book i realized immediately she was right and i really fucking hated her for that and we flew to vegas yeah and (laughs) but so i think really like if there's one thing i fucked up was I never really enjoyed it. It's the bit as well where she says to you when you, like, you're, you want to leave, but they won't let you leave. Yeah. And she's like, you could just walk out the door yeah. because you've got but enough somebody money already. Somebody said this to me the other day, you know, and a lot. Of, this is another one of the big questions. But why didn't you just walk away? Why didn't you just walk away? And personally, I think if I was the kind of guy who would have just walked away and let City Bank win, in, I wouldn't yeah. be the kind of guy who's fucking here now going out every fucking week, filming a video on YouTube for no fucking money, trying to fucking stop the economy from collapsing. Because in both cases, I did those things because I didn't want the fuckers to win. I didn't want the fucking dickheads to win. And, and maybe, maybe that's a good thing and maybe that's a bad thing. And listen, there's a lot of other very successful traders in the world who have made millions of pounds like me 
and they're on beaches in the fucking Philippines drinking fucking Mai Tais. And I'm out here filming YouTube videos in the cold because I don't want the fucking economy to collapse. And whether that makes me a good person or whether that makes me a bad person, I don't know, but I'm the guy that you've got. I'm the guy that's here trying to stop it. And most people who have the success I've had in the city are not out here. It makes you somebody who's thinking about something bigger than themselves, which has to we be. We need a, good a lot thing, of people right? to try and stop it, but we really need to understand the problem. I think you uh, uh, enunciate or whatever, that, that it's describe it very well, much better than most people are at the moment in the way the press is describing it yeah. and stuff. And it's just adding fuel to this fire and creating this hate in this country. Yeah. And it's just not about that, you know? And it, it, it's. Um, yeah, but we've got we've got to fucking solve it because it is just a nightmare. We've got know? to find a way to bring people these together. Single, on this. And these little billionaires flying around, they're yeah. fucking miserable. Yeah, yeah. My friend went to a billionaire's party. I said, yeah. what was it like? I said, she said, God, it was just sad. Day. You know, I was saying, yeah. oh, one day, will you invite me to your billionaire party? She said, Andy, you won't like them. I've been to them. Yeah, yeah. He said they were had their KFC delivered and there was like Smarties and everyone's, everyone sits on their own, which is obviously yeah. weird because you have a servant there and like no one yeah, talks yeah, to each yeah, other. It's yeah, not, yeah. it's like, but I want to make it clear, I'm not out here because I hate the billionaires. And I didn't write this book because I hate bankers. I don't hate bankers and I don't hate billionaires. I want to show people what's happening. You know, I've seen this world. I was one of the best paid traders in the world because I understood the economy. And what I saw was a tsunami coming. And, I'm, and I got paid millions of pounds for that and everybody said, well done, do it again. I'm trying to ring the bell out here. I, listen, I'm from this country. I'm born and raised in this country. It's not just happening in this country. I'm from a poor background. I've got friends who skip meals to feed their kids, you know, and these are people who have jobs, hardworking people, you know what I mean? And I don't want this to happen. I don't, and I, and I know, I, I know I talk a bit of shit about Rishi Sunak here and there and I, I've never met the guy, right? I don't want to personalise this, right? This is about whether your kids are poor or not. Very quickly, best advice you've ever been given? There's a great speech in the book. There's a great speech after I lost a ton of money and Billy, my scouse trading guru. Yeah, everybody likes Billy. Um, you, you haven't heard the audio, but you haven't heard my Scouse accent. No. Liverpool's oh, okay. going mad for it. Um, <laughs> basically, I started bringing my textbooks into work because I lost a lot of money. Uh, the good economic student that, that I was. And this guy, Billy, he never went to university. The third day I did it, he just got pissed, stood up, slapped these books out of my hand, straight in the bin, put his face right in my face. What the fuck do you think you're doing, mate? Does this like, look like fucking Jack and Nori to you? Listen, how old are you, mate? You're not a kid anymore. If you want to, if you want to understand the economy, it's not in those books, mate. Go back home and ask your mum what her financial situation is like. Walk down the high street, look at what shops are closing down, what shops are opening up. Look at the advertisements on the tube. Is there more homeless people or less homeless people? Ask your friends, ask your friends' mums. The economy is out there. It's the real world. You're not a kid anymore. Look at it with your fucking eyes. And um, that's the best advice I was ever given. Uh, and that's basically the, ba that's the basis of my trading career, mate. You know, you, Look at what's happening. Keep Almost done over complicated too, because you I know, sort of cast Billy as Danny DeVito in my head. A lot of people are saying, was it Stephen Graham? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That'd work really well. Yeah. We've watched in the movie. So we'll yeah. See. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he'll you be. Act? Yeah. I was hoping to play Billy with my Scouse accent. I'm getting up to the age of it. Depends how long it takes. They'll age me a little bit. A worst advice. Worst. Somebody asked me this the other day. What's the worst advice I was ever given? I mean, when I was at uni, you get shepherded into the city and people sometimes ask me, do you regret it? Um, I don't regret it all. I don't really regret anything I've done. I made some mistakes, you know. I but you also didn't more. really get shepherded into the city in that... I was gunning for it, yeah. You kind so. of like went your own route, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, well, I got put into a pretty bad trade by the frog in the book. Yeah. But even that grew. I don't know. Look, I don't regret anything. Um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of dickheads around that will try and drag you the wrong way. Um, yeah. But uh, that keep, was keep good people close to you and uh, don't listen to the bad ones. Well, now you're a writer, I guess, yeah. are you? Yeah. Well, I wrote this book. I'm very proud of it. Yeah, what, I think it's what, good. What do you think is bullshit in publishing then or bullshit publishing. in YouTube? It's so mad because it, it's, you know, I studied maths and economics and I just like, I just jotted this book out and sent it to an agent and then suddenly we had like 12 offers and, you know, oh, publishing just dances around me and these are very nice people. That doesn't really Penguin, happen so. to most no. people. How long no. did it take you to write the book? Nine months of writing with nine months of thinking beforehand. Um, is it hard to like thing, write one yourself? One thing, there's a lot of like colloquial language in there mm. and a lot of the sort of very nice people were like editing my, this is incorrect grammar. And I was oh, like, yeah, no, yeah. We, we wanna, this is how people speak, mate. I, I wanted to channel my mates. I grew up in East London, East London slash Essex. I wanted to channel my great mates who, who tell stories in the pub. I wanted to feel there with me. And um, some people didn't get it, but some people did. And, um, you know, it's, 
it's changing. It's changing. So in, in the end, I, you know, I refused all the edits and I kept the voice in there and, and I hope people like it. I hope it, it's, 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 it's how people talk. Um, okay, now we're going to do the quick fire round. This is, we're going to ask. We're going to... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> okay, Gary, now we're going to do the quick fire round. This is where we're going to ask you a list of questions to get you know know you a little better. And you have to answer them as quickly as possible. D, cue the music, please. And we're off. Uh, what was your first job? Uh, paper, paper boy, yeah. What was your worst job? Uh, I love being a paper boy. My worst job was probably working in the city. Mm. And, oh, if I have a bad one? So I know. Being a trader. <laughs> uh, not working on that spreadsheet at the end. Oh, yeah. No, I actually, because I never, that was actually really hilarious. I, um, you got to read that story of me refusing to do the spreadsheet. Yeah. Great. Uh, Favourite subject at school? Maths, obviously it's maths. Love maths. What's your special skill? I can see the future, mate. Nice. That's how I make my money and uh, it's not good. Let's change it. What did you want to be when you grew up? When I was in primary school, reception, I was a bit of a, like, good in school. And my teacher, Miss Winus, I was four or five, said to me, Gary, you're very smart. When you can grow up, you can be anything you want to be. And I said, Miss, I want to be a footballer. Awesome. And she said, you can't be a footballer. So my uh, horizons <laughs> were narrowed early on. Uh, what did your parents want you to be? A uh, Mormon missionary. Wow. That's why you know about Mormons. Parents that would be Mormons. a whole nother life story. Uh, what's your go-to karaoke song? My Way, Frank Sinatra. Also like Common People by Pulp. Yeah. Yeah. I d uh, my Way, definitely. Uh, office Dogs, Business or Bullshit? Office Dogs. Mm -hmm. But I can see you're a fan. I, I like the idea. Yeah, he's, he's been very well behaved. He hasn't said yeah, anything. Really There's a dog here for people who, who can't see. But Yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Have you ever been fired? I got fired from DFS four times. Which tells you, they kept having don't, you back. don't fuck with me because I'll get you back. Yeah. As you'll see if you read the book. What's your vice? Games, games, computer ambition. games. Oh, okay. Any kind of game, mate. But yeah, I love computer games. Okay. Nice. And that's, uh, that's uh, the end of it, really. Uh, top tips. Do you have any top tips for founders or entrepreneurs? Try and enjoy it as best you can. Don't work too hard. Don't burn yourself out. This is a me Those being Mr. Sensible. Yeah. And any recommendations for us on what to read or watch or listen Other to? Other than my book. Um, I'll tell you some books that really inspired me. Gabriel Krauser, who they was. Beautiful London voice. Very strong. It's a bit aggressive. There's some violence in it. Love it. Great book. Um, what other books? Candide by Voltaire was a bit of inspiration. That's a bit old school. I love anything Dickens. Um, I love Harry King. I think Dickens is a real, real men's books. Yeah, you don't like I them? find Dickens really like... Yeah. I just okay. We'll go with Wuthering Heights then. One of the best okay, books of all time. Enough. Beautiful book. It's Jane not like Pride and Prejudice. It's strong. Jane Eyre, brilliant book. Jane Eyre. Read I it. Like, I, I read didn't it. love it. I read it ages ago. I'm really? sorry. I'm sorry, but, but I'm sure it's such, I was very. Young. It's got really good comedy value. Okay, it's I was I was about twenty or nineteen when I read yeah. it. I preferred Wuthering Heights, but I'll give it another go if I get time. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> you want to plug something for thirty seconds? Yeah, Me personally, done anything recently? Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, look, this book is it's. A very personal story. It's, it's not just a book about finance. It's not just a book about trading. It's, it's really, it's a story. It takes you there. I want you to be there with me. 19 year old me trying to get a job in the city. 21 year old me walking into the trading floor. 24 year old me being the best trader in the world and losing my mind. Like, I want oh, you, you to were see, top in the world. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I want you to be, see the things that I've seen and then feel the things that I felt. And um, I want you to understand what's happening. And hopefully you understand that. So please go get the trading game. It's, um, it's my first book. It's, I put my heart into it. Please enjoy it if you get it. Fantastic. So there you have it. That was this week's episode of Business Without Bullshit. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Gary. You're amazing. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Pippa. Thank and you. we'll be back with our quiz, Business or Bullshit, on Thursday. Until then. It's ciao. <laughs>